My guest today is Adam Tuz. Adam is a professor of history at Columbia University and serves as director of the European Institute. Adam is one of the most prolific and wide-ranging intellectuals of our time. He recently wrote the book that many consider the key account of the financial crisis of 2008 and its consequences. Crashed, how a decade of financial crisis changed the world. Adam, thanks, thanks for being here. I've been really looking forward to talking to you about all, these, uh, all, all, the, all the historical events we are, we're watching. Um, in your, in your um, crash, in your book about the financial crisis, you were highly critical of the European response to the US crisis and then to the Euro crisis. Um, have you been positively surprised this time? Has Merkel become something different than what you thought at the time? I think I have to admit to being surprised, yeah. I mean, as I think like most people um, who are concerned for Europe, uh, yourself included very much, I remember following your tweets and stuff, this spring was pretty hair-raising. Um, it looked like we were going down exactly the disastrous route that we had been down before. It looked as though we were caught, you know, with all the talk about using the ESM mechanism, whatever its technical merits one way or the other, in the politics of the past fundamentally all the way through, to be honest, until early May. I mean, it was very frantic, and I'm sure that you felt that, you know, being in Europe yourself and at the heart of things there very directly. Um, there was an excellent set of proposals on the, on the table from, from the southern states. This isn't rocket science. It was pretty obvious what needed to happen, and there seemed to be an absolutely disastrous logjam. And as much as anything, it was the politics. It was just the insouciance with which the northern states just wiped aside these proposals in late March that was, I think, profoundly alarming. And then, yes, I have to admit to being surprised. Um, not because, you know, there aren't excellent people in Germany and great economists and the folks in the finance ministry are different from the way they were under Schäuble, but simply because even knowing all of that, there was just this question as to whether the politics would shift. Mm -hmm. And they did. And um, in retrospect, and I'm a historian, so I'm used to this kind of activity, but because I'm, it's, you, one can think of reasons why, but I think as a historian and as someone interested in history, one should also recognize shocks when they happen. And those consist precisely in ex post being different from ex ante. And this is one of those moments where we have to say our ex ante expectations were pretty downbeat to be honest and yeah. Merkel was true to form in that respect all the way through to early May and then all of a sudden something happens and so then in retrospect you're thinking okay so why could that be and um you know what well, I think you say yeah. again but, I we mean, like to think on this, on, <laughs> on this side are, of the world we like to think that 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 parliament had had something to do you know we, we put two resolutions in, yes. in April and May Yeah. where we had 505 MEPs voting in favor of some huge response. And one of the advisors here uh, of, of, of Macron told me, like, they sent one of them to the Elysee with a list of votes, and they said, this can happen. All the government uh, parties in Europe actually voted in favor. This can be done. Yeah. So I, 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 I like to think that we contributed to breaking some of these logjam, uh, mental logjam. I'm sure that's true. I think, we, you know, we, we say too often, I think, there's no such thing as a European polity, there's no European demos. And it's not true. I mean, it may not be true in the sense that we have national demoi or whatever the, the, the mm -hmm. plural is, but there is a densely networked, complex, uh, multi-layered polity taking shape in Europe, in which mm -hmm. I am sure you're right that the shift in opinion in the parliament resonating with a very marked shift in opinion in Germany itself that was picked mm -hmm. up by Spiegel and by opinion polling yeah. there that cannot have been lost on the pollsters that we know Merkel consults on a daily basis uh, in guiding her you know middle of the road path um, that that resonated very powerfully in Berlin and we know it also operated you know between the Elysee as opposed to the French Treasury and the German Finance Ministry as opposed to the Chancellery right and those kind of complicated yeah. geometries where Macron knows, um, knows his, you know, his German counterpart from previous rounds of the Eurozone crisis. Um, you know, that is constituting something like a polity in which the movements can be quite subtle, but then in the end rather decisive. And I also think, 
you know, stepping back a little bit, this is precisely the sort of crisis which is good for Merkel, because she's not, I think, a conviction European politician in the mode of a Kohl or an Adenauer. We know that, that's a cliche. But she is a conviction modernist. She's a conviction globalist. That's why she thinks Europe matters, not because she's passionate about, you know, Europe and its neighbours, though she's very wide, very cosmopolitan and not a German nationalist. But, but she doesn't have that sort of, you know, ooh, European feel. But she is deeply, deeply concerned about globalization and how you, as it were, effectively govern democracies under conditions of, of globalization. And so COVID is a perfect kind of shock for that kind of a politician, because this is a novel, anthropocenic, the sort of thing we've been thinking and worrying about for decades, it's arrived. And this is exactly the sort of crisis that Europe has to prove itself in. And so I think, you know, seen from that kind of view mm -hmm. point, this was a schema that she could put this into. If what we're talking about is the old legacy issues of, you know, a moral hazard and Italian budgeting and all of those of things, yeah. it, we're stuck. Mm -hmm. It's a dead end. But if the question is, can Europe respond adequately to a 21st century global challenge? Then you know Merkel's kind of more open-minded, right? And the then problem with that, the problem with that view, though, Adam, is is if, if this is some really distinct, isolated event, oh, then yeah. does it really mean we're putting yes. forward steps towards a better Europe, or are we just solving one particular problem, or we still have all the rest? Is this going uh, to be a step towards a solution in your view? This, of course, is the huge proviso on the entire July deal. But if you define yeah. the problem in those terms, the the, the the, the step forward you could make is precisely at the price of not dealing with any of the legacy issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And furthermore, in defining this as an emergency. Now, if you, if you, of course, say we're in an Anthropocene now, and so we got to expect more and more of these emergencies, and so we need a standing capacity. But as soon as you make that argument, then the German conservatives will come in and say, okay, well, then we need no, a short no, 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 no. then we need fiscal capacity. So as no. soon as we've done this, we need to, we need to pull this all back so that we can yeah. do it again, you know, so we're not you know, overburdened. So it's a very, I agree with you, it's a slippery, complicated argument, but I think it may have been quite important in May in opening this door. Does it therefore lead forward to a sort of stepwise incremental federalism? I think that's up for grabs and that's for further political argument. That is, as you say, in no way a done deal. Yes. Um, we've, but, but, but what we avoided was disaster. I mean, what, what yes, Europe avoided clearly. was was a political disaster. Clearly. It didn't fail. <laughs> Particularly um, concerning, and sometimes I, I wonder about it, is that once you put this really step towards the fiscal union and you do all these things, if this money is not well spent, if people yeah. feel this was all thrown away and it wasn't yeah. useful, then instead of a step forward, could be the end. Yeah. Yeah. People could say, look, no the post insurance, no fiscal union, no nothing, because these yeah. southern guys are going to just throw it all away. There is also a risk of it being a big step backwards, correct? Exactly. I mean, Pisani Ferry made this argument in a, in a piece uh, recently, and I thought that was quite compelling that, that in a sense, it's not enough to simply, you know, if you're keen on federalism, which, which I certainly am, I, I, then mm -hmm. it's not enough to say we didn't do enough, we need to do more. You actually also have to demonstrate mm -hmm. that what you did was not a mistake. And so... Mm -hmm. I agree with you entirely. And this is where I think issues to do, say, with the misuse of funds in Hungary become functional. It's not just, as it were, that as liberals or people concerned with the rule of law, that we have an interest, as it were, in leveraging this money to ensure that it doesn't support regimes which are rule of law breaking. It's also a question simply of budgetary control. And we know that the, you know, the, 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 in, in the Hungarian case, there is a huge preponderance of, of accusations of malfeasance and corruption in that one particular country. It totally dwarfs the old Southern European thing, um, which I think is very easily exaggerated. But the strong Europeans in the Southern states have always understood this logic, right? That it, it, was, it was a sort of a, a ratcheting effect, the vincolo externo type argument where, drawing on outside resources was also constantly a test and a way of, as it were, imposing internal discipline when it seemed necessary. And I don't want to fall into cliches about like Southern corruption, because we know mm. perfectly well, you know, Belgium, Germany, these are not, yes. you know, if they manage to appear as a like, debate. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, let's, be, let's be honest, like, you know, but, but, but we know how that plays politically. And, and, um, and so I agree with you, it is indeed. And, 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 and 
and this isn't matter it isn't a matter of political appearances right i mean the climate problem is absolutely real right? we you know this is a one off chance to spend a lot of money actually yeah. really making a difference like it isn't the the constitu the timelines of the anthropocenic crisis are now so short that they overlap with the problem of making the european constitution right they're not separate yeah. issues where as it were we can use yeah. climate as a test for the longer term problem of the constitution yeah. no this is this is what our chance yes, to to achieve it. transformation now this is it there's no do overs right yeah. so yeah. so for all of those reasons absolutely this is um a yes. huge test for those who, who uh, having gotten the money is just the beginning of demonstrating um, yeah. and solving these problems. Yeah, I hope we're able to. So, so let me, we go back to Europe in, in, in a short while probably, but, but let me just ask you one question about all this extra money everywhere, which is when we were thinking about all this extra money in March, in April, in May, um, we always thought, okay, six months, seven months, eight months, all these support, not just in Europe, but in the US, in every country, can be supported. Can, how, how long, you think on a historical perspective, I mean, how long can this kind of like massive support by the state, massive increase in debt, how long can this last? I mean, you've been always on the dovish side of the debate saying, okay, mm -hmm. central banks can support and support, but is there a risk? Do you see a risk that at some point this is really just too much that we're doing and that we need to really start stepping back? What's your view? Um, for large, compact, um, properly sovereign, big states, um, but even like middle-sized ones, even the UK appears, I mean, and you'd think they were not too big to fail, but even in the UK, um, I don't think there's any practical limit. In other words, the, the, the limit there may be is so far off that there are other things in the meantime that are more important. So as Japan has demonstrated, depending on how you count it, right, debt there is 180% or 220% of GDP. Um, uh, um, so Chase and Furman, I don't know whether you've seen it, but he published just literally this to this morning in a conversation with Peterson. At Paul Peterson, he did this, he did this fundamental critique of the debt to GDP ratio, in which he said, look, the debt is a stock, GDP is a flow. If you wanted to do a stock stock comparison you'd have to turn the gdp of the united states into a stock so what is the net present value present of the value. infinite time horizon of the american gdp somebody's, interest rate. <laughs> somebody's done this calculation and it's something like eight gazillion or you know it, yeah. it's, it's, it's a number yeah. and so like um all of that is just simply saying i don't think there is a limit and um uh, um, for well-constructed states, um, for those who have that basic integrity of a fiscal and a monetary system which is tightly coupled and have a high degree of external credibility. And if they're big enough actors, they change the game for everyone else as the Fed has demonstrated over and over again. But, um, and wartime yes. demonstrates this, right? You can go to a huge numbers of GDP and hold it for, for years, long enough you, for us to deal with COVID. Do you put a tricky, a scary proviso which yes. is a political one, which is yes. for well-constructed well states, for a monetary and political and fiscal. Yeah. Europe doesn't have all these no. conditions. Is there a political limit in Europe that yes. other countries wouldn't have in terms of like, at some point, somebody in the board of the ECB says, stop. Yeah. Yes, exactly. There is obviously in Italy is the, is the, is the canary in the gold mine, right? Um, there are going to be other states which will be also in, you know, have really large debt to GDP ratios after this crisis, including France. But um, Italy is the one that's probably going to cross the 150% threshold, which you know, has no substantive significance. It's just sort of psychologically striking. Yeah. And um, probably next year, right? Um, and um, there is absolutely no reason why that ought to be a problem. Even, you know, if Italy was freestanding, it wouldn't be a problem. If Italy is thought of as integrated into the Eurozone as a whole, then the debt to GDP ratio for the whole bloc is well below that of the United States. Um, so there's no reason to worry at all. But, the, but a Europe is, as you say, in this incredibly uncomfortable halfway house where we constructed a monetary union that in a sense deprived its entities of of the conventional accoutrements of fiscal and monetary sovereignty. And we did this, Europe did this deliberately, um, yeah. assuming, I think, a basically benign external environment. Um, and that, of course, has not turned out to be, to be the situation at all. And then this shock also has, is not, in fact, symmetric. This is, in fact, an asymmetric shock. 
um, it turns out because of the impact on Spain and Italy being being much worse. So, so that is a huge, and I, to my mind, it just forces this issue and it forces Europe to an uncomfortable kind of fork where either you choose to bury this issue, which is what happened with the German Constitutional Court judgment over the summer, probably mm -hmm. to everyone's relief, yeah. but an opportunity, as it were, to have an open political conversation about the mandate and the legitimacy of the ECB was, was, was sidestepped, shall we say, and in, so there's a technocratic solution, which is that, that this is buried on the ECB's accounts. Yeah. No one asks any questions and yeah. it stays there. But this is hugely vulnerable, exactly as you said, to troublemakers and spoilers. Mm. Um, and they will predictably come along. Um, and so for me, the question is whether Europe can really avoid that bigger conversation. And I always took the um, whatever it takes of Mario Draghi to be conditioned on the teleological view that said we're headed towards becoming a fully fledged entity. You know, he had that weird thing about bumblebees and flying machines. And, but there was this, in that whatever it takes, which is a functional requirement of short term macro management, there was an implicit bigger historical vision. Um, and the two were hinged together um, they were too tightly linked, quite tightly linked. And um, I do think that that question is still outstanding with Europe. Sure. You're, 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 you know much more about Germany than, than I know. Uh, what is actually your guess? Will, will Germany be, be willing once this get, gets out of the technocratic, oh, we are just talking about price stability and actually gets to the point where we are actually talking about, hey, what is the role of the ECB and, and the yeah. kind of questions you were posing? Do you, do you see that risk as actually a, a realistic uh, potentially we could we see let me put it another way the risk of another sovereign crisis coming from from people wondering and and, and questioning this kind of uh, construction i think there's definitely a, i mean you know it's a, it's a banality in a sense to say there's a risk these are democracies so as we know only too well in the united yeah. states really yeah. it's bottomless it's political all the way yeah. down absolutely everything can be questioned um, and my instinct is, as a sort of progressive left liberally sort of person, is to say, look, better to trust to more democracy. Mehr Demokratie wagen, you know, Willy Brandt's slogan. I think Germany yeah. has one of the most mature political cultures in the world. It, that is yeah. not without exceptions. Obviously, there, are, there, are, there is a terrible, terrible right wing fringe, which is a nightmare. Um, but it has one of the most sophisticated political cultures in the world. Its media are not all trashy by any means. Um, it, it has what you would, it, what you would, to me, it's quite an important test case of the possibility of having a rational, serious debate about this in a democracy. What I would fault too many German politicians for having failed to do is to put what is obviously the question. And I do think they're terrified of actually talking openly about what's, what we're discussing. In other words, the political role of the central bank, it's, foul, it's foundationally political role because the Bundesbank tradition, which they all defer to, was foundationally anti-democratic. Right? It, was, it was about, it was an entity created by the occupying forces and it was an expression of a profound anxiety on the part of the German political class about essentially two massive derailments of politicized monetary policy under, you know, in the early Weimar Republic and then under Hitler. And so there was a profound, I don't mean this in a sort of, you know, anti, you know it was an anti-majoritarian construction, a bit like yeah. Supreme Courts are as well, right? And, yeah. um, and so it is, it is, and it's obviously, and one should not be glib about this. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it is taking one of the most fundamental elements of the modern constitution fundamentally and saying, look, let us face the fact that this is political as well. And so yeah. can we actually have a reasonable conversation about this? And, uh, and unfortunately, there are, there are very few voices in the German mainstream political scene in which I would include, say, Die Linke as a, in this sense, a mainstream political party that are willing to really touch this. Um, yeah. It's one of my agendas with progressive colleagues of various types and NGOs in Germany is to promote a debate about democratic politics and money with an eye to Europe, of course, because that's yeah. what we're really talking about here. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit scary. I mean, uh, you, you make these points in your book. Uh, Paul, I remember when Paul de Grauwe kind of first kind of 
put it square in the center of the of the euro crisis uh, the fact that uh, countries have resigned uh, a key support for their sovereign uh, yeah. for the sovereignty in, in terms of their ability to support their own debt etc and that we had become um, I think he talked about uh, we had become developing countries in some sense and, and this this debt crisis was that and nobody in Germany and nobody in northern Europe yeah. I think shared that view. And the fact is when Mario Draghi said what he said, it was pretty clear that that was the problem. And it still yeah. hasn't really permeated. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, there's a, you know, they, 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 they essentially kind of created, you know, in the normal hierarchy, there's advanced economies and emerging markets and emerging markets are subject to various types of fiscal and monetary constraints, yes. you know, as a result of power. This is, this is, these are, these are the ways in which, hierarchies expresses itself in the international economy. They're matters of trust, they're matters of credibility, they're matters of connection, they're matters of actual economic capacity to service debt because countries at middle incomes have less surplus, if you like, in their ability to service debt. And what the Europeans did is to create a kind of, exactly as you said, a kind of intermediary category of yeah. advanced economies with emerging market-like external constraints in which yeah. then the Germans and the Dutch could be endlessly South Korea or something, you know, yes. <laughs> and the Italians were endlessly relegated to the position of Argentina and or, yeah. or the Greeks were Argentina and the Italians yeah. were, you know, yeah. were South Some Africa or something. Like, yeah. it's, it's like, it's, it's very, um, and it is, it's an anti-political construction, right? It's, uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's very, very, and it, it's, it has spun very bizarre cycles because then, as it were, the politics of debt, especially on the left, began to be modelled on the experience of Greece, which was real, and it was an experience of victimization. But of course, it's utterly unrepresentative of the actual experience of advanced economies, even ones which are being, a, by any standard, appallingly governed, like Britain. Yeah. has not a suffered a bond vigilante attack. <laughs> you know, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, 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 how, I mean, I think, you know, Remainers like myself expected the bond vigilantes to arrive yeah. as the wrathful, punishing vengeance of rational markets that would, that would, you know, bang heads together and, like, demonstrate the total yeah. impossibility of the Brexit project. And no. <laughs> no, they didn't uh, save us. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there's, I mean, there is something, you know, pure and good about the whole order liberal construction. Okay, money is something too important to let it to politicians, and we need to give independence to central banks. But, but the truth is, when you couple it with, with lacking any, uh, any tool for fiscal integration, then you really create something that, that, uh, I mean, causes, I think, some, some, <laughs> potential sovereign mm -hmm. debt crisis uh, concerns or recurrently i mean i think i think your, your analysis exactly yes to that. i mean unless unless in, and 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 and, it, and it's hugely you know this is the conversation about you know pre-existing problems in a sense and unless you're willing to level the playing field as you go into a system like that have some sort of like you know cap where all debt above 60 percent is taken off onto the ECB's balance sheets and neutralized there. It creates these permanent asymmetries within the, within the structure, yeah. which are uh, terrible for European politics. Mm. So, so let me go back to COVID. Um, do you think we can finish this and go back to a semblance of a normal life without a vaccine? Are we, are we basically waiting for a vaccine? Uh, is there, is there a, an alternative? What, what's your sense of, of what we're seeing? Well, it depends very much, um, I think, normal, normal life, um, as opposed to a sort of improvised normal life, um, the sort of interaction that we're having by yeah. Zoom, whatever, which has flourished and has been very rich yeah. and, you know, yeah. has been very eye-opening. You know, yeah. My wife this morning contracted to have French lessons from a woman in Tibet. <laughs> you know, or Nepal, <laughs> Nepal. Like, you know. Fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Like, so, you know, um, but... That kind of normal, normal life will, of course, depend on a vaccine. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm unlikely to be able to resume my transatlantic existence until there's a vaccine. Um, a large part of the of economic activity, however, already has resumed, didn't stop. People work in car factories, wearing masks, socially distanced. You know, I, I don't, you, you, there's a, there are, however, very large parts of the economy which simply can't resume. So, 
you know, the, the entire tourism, the entire travel sector. And, and, you know, we do tend to have assumptions about these being rather ephemeral or incidental parts of the economy, which is nonsense. Right? They're huge uh, yeah. in Spain, in Italy, in a big city like New York. Um, I think, you know, the lobbyists for the travel and tourism industry say it's 10% of global GDP. Mm -hmm. um, in Spain's oh, quite a bit more than that. For Spain, for Spain, of course, it, it's much more. Um, and that, of course, then has hugely ramifying effects. You know, the airline, yeah. Rolls-Royce, the yeah. Airbus, Boeing, yeah. um, and a 10% hit to GDP is, of course, absolutely historic. <laughs> like to, to bite a 10% slice out of a modern economy is a shock worse than, you know, it's, it's worse than anything other than the Great Depression or one of the two major wars that, you know, 2008 was, was nothing like that, uh, except yeah. in the worst cases in the Eurozone where, you know, where there was a, a GDP hit of that kind of size. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I don't think that any of those bits of the economy can go back to anything like normal until, till there's a vaccine. I mean, I, given our situation in the latest data out of China, of course, suggests that if you achieve total suppression the way they yeah. effectively did, uh, the latest figures I've seen for the last week literally show airline traffic back to pre to pre crisis levels. In fact, slightly above metro traffic, just slightly below. But they have achieved suppression. But they um, doesn't look like any of us have chosen that. Any of our economies, and I don't no, think we, our societies can deal with that. We missed right? our chance in February. We had to do what they did in February, and we just didn't understand. And and I just think nobody was arguing for that, right? No, the, nobody was nobody, arguing. No, we no, were flattening no, the curve. Yeah. making it easier on ERs. We really didn't think, let's just stamp the thing out. And we would have needed to have done it in February, right? To achieve Chinese success, you need to actually react at yeah. the same speed as the Chinese and the South Koreans. Because effectively, this is, I think, where our brains have just not caught up with, and our bodies have not caught up with yeah. globalization. Because if the problem was in Wuhan and Beijing had to shut down, Beijing is a thousand kilometers from Wuhan. Right. So, you know, so, so we were literally, it was literally the same problem. It wasn't a Chinese problem that was going to get to us a month later. It was already our problem in the same way as it was a Chinese problem. And we just don't have that comprehension of globalization at this point. London and New York would have had to react in the same way as Beijing had reacted within a matter of days, if not weeks. Um, and as you say, there's a huge narcissism in the British case, in the American case, of like endlessly attacking their political class for failing to respond. No one's did. <laughs> yeah. You know, no one, it's, you can look yeah. around the entire world, no one is capable of, and the exceptions are the South Koreans, yeah. the Taiwanese, the Japanese, and yeah. New Zealand, who are immediately up against China and therefore just yeah. don't see China as remote, because it isn't. Um, so, so what should be our policy response? Should be we be in the meantime protecting the old jobs like we're doing now should we already be moving towards letting resources shift towards new jobs and letting hotels and, and bars and restaurants kind of lose employment can we be doing this for another year year and a half uh, the same kind of like freezing things in place um yeah, I mean, I think it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's an agonizingly difficult question. It's not made any easier for, by the fact that my wife is actually in the travel business. So she, she runs a, she runs a high end boutique travel operation. And wow. so I am experiencing this uncertainty that millions of people in that sector are experiencing firsthand. And uh, so I, I feel, I mean, truly um, party pre in the sense that I find it difficult to imagine that most of all of that won't come back. I mean, we've seen how Europeans responded this summer. Given half a chance, they will start yeah. traveling again. Yeah. Um, so as it were, to allow too much scarring, to, to allow too much physical, you know, decay, closures of hotels, that, that kind of thing just seems short sighted to me because we'll end up wanting to build that back as soon as the virus is because these are, you know, this is what people want to spend money on when they're more affluent. Yeah. I think the longer term considerations are more to do with climate policy and the compatibility of this entire lifestyle with, you know, the climate, the Paris commitments over the next 10 to 20 years. And that's a different time horizon and requires a different set of adjustments. Um, and I think integrating those two considerations together, but then that does squarely fall under the so the rubric of the just transition. In other words, if we are going to, as it were, put a timeline on EasyJet, Ryanair, whatever they're all called nowadays, um, 
then we need to be clear about that. We need to start building the social compromises and the social compact around that horizon. And we shouldn't, we should, this is an opportunity as it were to start that conversation. But I think I'm very, I've never found, I've never found the argument highly persuasive, the punitive version of it anyway, I find totally unpersuasive, that this should be a moment as it were to punish the airlines for their failure to build financial reserves and so on. That, 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 that is not not a compelling logic to me politically, but mm -hmm. opening up the conversation about how we make a more sustainable travel and tourism sector possible, this is mm -hmm. obviously a good moment to do that. It might, it might be less the tourism which suffers than the, the business trips that people like I you know, and I We used to love so much. <laughs> to give uh, one talk in yeah, New York yeah, for yeah, three it's hours. It's insane, yeah. Taking, uh, uh, maybe that's the part that we can do this, this other way. I, I, I would tend to agree, yeah, much as it pains me to say so, because it, yeah. it, it was great, great while it lasted. But it, <laughs> um, so, it's, so, yeah. yeah. So, it's hugely so inefficient. Could, this is what I've really discovered. It's like what an amount of time you save by just having these conversations like this. Yeah, and you can talk to so many other people. Like you could just, I have, have to bring you over to Brussels yeah. and book you a hotel and trip. I would, I would yeah. probably have tried to have you over for a talk, but yeah. it would have been some massive logistic operation. Yeah. And it would take uh, most of a week out of my life. Yeah. And, yeah. And, um, and, and jet lag and tiredness yeah. and, 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 and all No, the and way. the opening up. I'm teaching a class right now at Columbia with students as far afield as Singapore, India, Iceland, several different yeah. locations in Europe and all points of the compass in the United States. And it works just fine. Uh, it actually it actually does so let me go back to vaccines um you wrote a really fascinating piece recently uh in september on, on on the vaccine race and the geopolitical consequences and, and and basically you're trying to kind of forecast and think ahead of, of all this national uh competition between national champions and also the businesses the, com the companies the, the mm -hmm. countries trying to get their hands on this on these on these vaccines and and you fear it could end up being some sort of symbol of global injustice where some people are left behind, et cetera. Tell us a little bit how you, what, what, what do you expect to happen once, let's say, May, June uh, next year, uh, we are lucky enough to really have something that, that can be mass produced and mass distributed? Well, I mean, I think... Um the, the question that the, the sort of abstract question that concerns me around this is really uh, you know, how we think about the, legit the legitimacy and the framing of, of capitalism as it currently functions. And to my mind, the best way to think about that is sexually. So we were talking earlier on about finance. And obviously, I was thinking very hard about 2008 and how is it where the financial system is embedded in the modern uh, political system. And, you know, and obviously in Europe right now, a huge hot potato is the issue of tech and how big tech functions and how we square, as it were, our interest in the sort of technology you and I are using right now with politics, profit, and so on. And so if you look at the kind of list of sectors that might matter here, you know, it's a kind of a handful, maybe slightly more, but it's finance, tech, food and agriculture, manufacturing supply chains, um, and then pharma, like is a, is a huge life sciences and the complex of, that's tied up with health is I would say like up there in that short list of sectors which really define what it is we mean when we say, you know, how do we live with capitalism? How do we govern it? How do we, how do we make it a, a flywheel for prosperity and general prosperity rather than just, you know, division and, 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 and elite affluence? And in this case, it's really on the test bed because in a way which is extraordinarily destabilizing to ordinary governance, we are, as you, exactly as you just asked me, is it, are we effectively waiting for one or two companies to make a technological breakthrough to resume our ordinary lives? Like that's not a question we normally ask ourselves in the matter of governance. It's too particular, it's like a sort of pyramid point, you know, it's like a pyramid inverted standing on its tip. It's the sort of, for want of a nail, the war was lost. Are we really yeah. saying that for, for, for our inability to spend a billion dollars to find one of these vaccines, we can't get back to regular life? It's, yeah. it's profoundly, yeah. so it's, it's, it's very destabilizing. It's a little bit like the shock of discovering that Lehman Brothers had too much mortgage-backed securities from some obscure Florida suburb yes. on its books, yeah. and that was going to blow the world up. Like, you know, so 
that's how I kind of, this is why it seems to me really fascinating to think about. And the, and the, the possibilities for next spring are, you know, radically divergent. You know, one of the cooperative projects could come good, uh, in which case it would vindicate a model of collaboration. There could even be a sort of told you so type scenario in which America doesn't, hasn't contracted for one of the vaccines that works, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not a Chinese or a Russian vaccine. It could be one of the ones that's coming out of the UN brokered program that works. We know there's very formidable research capacity invested in those. And we know in the end, after all, the trials have been run in emerging market settings often, and the ultimate mass manufacturers of this are likely to be in India in many cases. So this is not, you know, this is not a simple win for the powerful necessarily. But there are, of course, other scenarios in which the American government has done some tie up with a handful of American or European drug companies um, and they get there first and they monopolize the first round of vaccines. And then I would regard this as quite possibly a very serious blow to the international legitimacy, right? Because how many we months have turned... do we be talking about? It? How many months do you think we could be talking about since? until 200 million Americans get vaccinated and we are all watching? How, how I, I'm no, trying it, it to could, just visualize. No, 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 I mean, it could, be, it, could be, it could be, you know, several months, um, which would be enough. I think even the very idea is sort of, yeah. But all of, I mean, <laughs> all of the countries that have, you know, the UK has done something similar, right? All of the countries which have bargained for that kind of position have, in a sense, chosen to play that game to some degree and there is i'm not making light of this after all national governments have you know in the t in the jargon of like finance a fiduciary obligation to do mm -hmm. this like this is their job yeah. right <laughs> so how do you stabilize a politics i mean how can an american politician at the margin say well no actually that batch of 10 million is going to go to you know primary care workers in south africa as opposed to second or third tier priorities in the united states Th those are very difficult trade-offs to stabilize which is why you might think we had an interest this is sort of an eu type answer in building this up making it complex making it multi-layered diffusing the sense of distributional anguish that might arise without you know the un doesn't have the doesn't have the frame to do the that the truth is that the governance is i mean as you said the US so has weak. said it will not participate in the covax in the un sponsor yeah. program yeah. russia as, as you say in your article has rushed to to to, uh, to 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 do their unproven vaccine, which yeah. we know China is is already talking with yeah. with Bolsonaro and, and getting their military uh, first. I mean, the governance. I mean, we all have these these ideas of global governance in the areas you said in finance, mm -hmm. but the truth of the matter is, when it gets to the moment when when these kind of choices have to be made, it, it seems like uh, the national interest, particularly given the U.S. currently, is going to be really take the first the first uh, the very. Uh, yeah. first. And what really struck me coming to this field, like, I mean, this wasn't a field I'd previously been terribly interested no. in, except in the abstract that it was yeah. one of these, like, you know, handful of sectors that clearly mattered. Uh, what really strikes me is just this, the orders of magnitude difference, right? You know, we, we think of the IMF as undersized with a firepower of, you know, 1.3 trillion easily available for lending. That's undersized relative to the needs of the global economy, clearly. But, you know, the WHO's budget is two and a half billion a year. I mean, it's yeah. the size of a large Manhattan hospital. It's insane. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's a Potemkin village um, of globalization. It doesn't actually exist as a, in any real sense of the word, right? It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't have a dollar for every inhabitant of, of, of the world. <laughs> you know, it's silly. Like, it's, it's um, sorry, it's kind of puzzling. Is that really true? Yeah. Yes, it is true. It's like no, so it yes. for every inhabitant of the world. It's, you know, and all it's got to do is preside over questions like, is this a pandemic and should we react? I mean, it's, it's absolutely, and even the drug push now, this is the other thing that really sort of blew my mind. It's like when we talk about the energy problems, when an agency like the IEA talks about the scale of investment that's necessary, or the EU talks about the scale of ne investment necessary for a big green push, hundreds of billions of dollars a year, obviously, trillion dollars mm -hmm. over, many trillions of dollars over a decade. 
And in this case, you know, Operation Warp Speed, America's great nationalist exercise, is $10 billion. I mean, that's, that's one $10 aircraft carrier. For the trillion dollar for problem. The multi-trillion dollar problem. There's a huge, you know, Lord Stern apparently once said that like climate change was the greatest market failure. And I'm just not entirely certain he's right. I think we may have, I mean, the very least we found another one, which is pretty massive. It's I mean, it's gigantic. Yeah, gigantic. gigantic, yeah. And these are good jobs, right? The, the funny thing that puzzles me about this is that if we had reserve capacity in this area, say what we were building was like, you know, the reserve capacity of big drug development pipelines, you know, for, I mean, because we also need therapeutics. You know, this would be, this, this, is a, this, is a, this is good money. This is something good to spend money on. If we're going to waste money on anything, like this seems like a really good thing to be wasting money on, you know? Yes. Like, you know, if we're going to have people standing around, like doing experimental things that don't necessarily pay off, I'd like it to be in like, biotech. that would be great. Like, um, so it seems so like- So what will be the consequence? Will, will all these challenges between countries, all these inequalities that will be generating getting the vaccines, will you see increasing tensions among nation states, currency wars, trade wars, even, even worse? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're already seeing how that could multiply out, ramify out. And, and you know, and, and one of the most absurd consequences in the American case is that the validation process itself becomes so politicized that it's not even obvious that if the American government has this vaccine, half the American population will take it, right? Because they don't trust it. Yeah. And they have some reason not to trust it, right? Yes. So, so it's, um, it's sort of grotesquely self-defeating. But... You know, I'm, I, you know, I, I think there's every reason in the world to be worried. But then I think you also have to look at the options that are available, right? And the, and I, I find, you know, sure, the Chinese doing a deal with Bolsonaro was distasteful under many aspects. But on the other hand, China collaborating. The reason why Brazil is such a good potential partner is that Brazil has a very proud, very long tradition of public health over 100 years old. The public health agency in Brazil is one of the kind of pillars of uh, Brazilian nationhood and statehood. They're therefore very highly competent at running these mass trials in the phase three that everyone needs. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's also an indication of the kind of possibilities inherent in this moment, right? To, to generate a vaccine as quickly as we have, Despite all of the mess we're making of it, the, the, the fact we're making a mess of it is less surprising to me than the fact that we might actually get a vaccine within about 18 months, which is remarkable. Yes. And if out of that comes a really meaty and significant alliance between Brazil and China, even if I have profound anxieties about the government of Brazil and the regime in China, I nevertheless think of this as an incredible human achievement of two very big societies with great human potential, fa fabulous doctors and, and nurses and med techs on both sides who solved this problem. And I would find it difficult not to cheer about that, right? Even if I'm not going to receive the vaccine first, I think of Brazil and I think of now not just football and samba and, you know, an extraordinary, vibrant, popular culture. I now think of it also as a place where you can do medical testing. So if you, if you, if you, if you think of the U.S. government, they might they might not see it that way. That way. You, you recently mentioned a quote of uh, Xi Jinping. Let me let me read it out uh, back to you. Uh, there is no such a thing as a so-called to see this trap in the world. With such major countries time and again make the mistakes of a strategic miscalculation they might create such traps for themselves so so the question is i mean maybe you want to remind uh, people watching what what the idea of the to see this trap that Alison brought back but but also whether whether this kind of multipolar brazil china kind of u.s feeling challenge is there a scope for miscalculation I mean, I think, you know, this is this very ancient idea that an or political order in which there is a um, an obvious shift in the balance of power, the obviousness of that prospect creates an instability because the incumbents have an interest in preemptively striking at their potential future challenges. And this creates a, a profound instability in the world. And so historically, looking at moments of transition, Athens and Sparta, 
Germany and Britain at the end of the 19th century, and then people fast forward to the present moment, China and the United States, create, as it were, moments where you can see a rational case for aggression. That's, I think, what we're trying to explain, is what would be the rational case for aggression? How do you move from various types of strategic rationality underpinning a stable status quo. It could be it could be an arms race, it could be a Cold War type status quo, but it would nevertheless be stable to a situation in which all of a sudden somebody has an interest to actually be the first mover in aggression. Mm -hmm. And and the idea is that this is a repeating driver of of war. And I, I'm not the kind of social scientist historian that thinks that these sorts of data sets with, very, with basically small ends, I think Alison has like 15 cases or maybe it's 20, but this shouldn't like, at this point, they sit, no one who's at all serious about statistics will take no. that seriously. Cause no. like you need an N of like a lot more than that for it to be worthwhile. Yeah. And this clearly isn't that kind of a problem, right? No. Um, it's, it's not like observing natural uh, behavior of various types or natural events. Um, and what is clear, and this is what Xi Jinping is pointing to, is that we have historical conscience. I mean, Xi Jinping is not like the world's greatest Marxist intellectual, but he does have, unlike a lot of Western Europeans, politicians, a deep founding in Marxist ideology. So, you know, all that he has founding in an ideology. And so for him, it's not at all difficult to like just play out this. And what he's saying is, look, it's not the objective material circumstances which bourgeois social science tells me I ought to worry about. But what does worry me is bourgeois social scientists. Because bourgeois social scientists will tell the hawks in the Pentagon that this is a worrying situation and they should act. And I know, you know, there's a lot of smart analysis of China right now which says we should be worried about Chinese analysts too. Of course, the, the funny thing about this is that if China is the rising power, it has absolutely no interest whatsoever in launching aggression. It will be the Americans who you would expect to strike first, right? Because this is the idea about what happened, say, in 1914, is the British, as it were, engineered the outbreak of World War I so as to deal a decisive blow to the, to the Germans. Um, and what I think is significant about Xi's point is that if we regard it in those terms, as it were, um, what do we make of this situation? There's clearly a problem, but the, the, the acid test is what we make of it. There are very significant in the modern period counterexamples, and the two that immediately come to mind, the most obvious one is Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s, um, who decided to step back from a dangerous arms race um, with the United States and ended the Cold War. Um, and the other slightly well less, less well known, but, but in some senses historically even more striking, is the retreat of Britain and the British Empire in the face of the rise of American power at the beginning of the 20th century. People who were operating the Thucydides trap logic, including people like Trotsky, assumed that there would be a struggle between, to the death between the British Empire and the rising American power. How could there not be? And it turns out that literally liberal, so the Lloyd George government um, um, in, the, in the early 1920s in Britain was able to do, was able to do the math um, and could think this through. It's the Lloyd George, I mean, it's this transitional group, including Winston Churchill at the time, um, who, who were able to figure work through the logic of this situation and say, you know what, yes, we might try and strike at the Americans, but in the end, we think it's a losing proposition and so better to, better to form a more or less strategic alliance with them. And, um, it's and that, hard to I think, think that, that there will be people like that now in the US thinking that way of China. Do you think? No, this is the, this I think is the great tragedy of our current moment is that certainly now on both sides of the aisle in Congress, we are baked into a very antagonistic position. And I'm not sit for a single second suggesting that, as it were, you know, there's all sorts of networks of culture and so on, which allow you, the French did the same thing, to construct the United States as a, you know, imaginary big brother, as a, as a natural ally. They didn't put the Statue of Liberty in New York for nothing. Like, you know, there's a logic to that. Obviously, the gap between the United States now and Xi Jinping's China is immense. Um, but I think that is the challenge of, 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 of current statecraft, is to think our way past this. And I don't think I've anything, I don't think I've, I will ever forget opening the pages of the Financial Times electronically in the last couple of days and seeing a map of Taiwan displaying where the invasion beaches would be. I mean, this is, 
this is I to my mind like crazy talk um, I, I know there were serious people on both sides in the Chinese side no doubt on the American side for sure who game that kind of thing all the time but that's their job as soldiers right they're, they're supposed to prepare for those kind of contingencies but the fact that it's being allowed to take on the political prominence that it has is a sign of a very serious deterioration and, and um, it could be it's quite worrying I think yeah on the, on the half full part, uh, glass, I guess, uh, and you've been thinking a lot about climate lately, yeah. the fact that uh, China has declared that they are going to, the, the phrase is they will scale up its intended national determined contribution by adopting more vigorous policies and aim to have emissions peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060, which is something that is almost the same as Europe. We're talking about 2050. Yes. And you basically, the way you, you evaluated this, this statement was that with those two sentences, China's leader may have to really find the future prospect for humanity. It's pretty massive that China actually has, I don't think many of us expected it, no. that China has embraced wholeheartedly this agenda. Yeah, it changes the game completely in so many different ways that I think we're going to, it's going to take a long time to figure out the full import of it because it's, on the one hand, it's, it's, um, it's totally game changing because, uh, because you know, the premise of global climate negotiations back to the 1990s was that the big emerging market states didn't make these kind of commitments, right? Because the problem was not historically theirs. It had been created by Europe and the United States. It was their problem to fix. And, and all the way through to Copenhagen, this was the position India and China dug in on. And the Europeans, to their credit, levered them out of that. It was Durban in 2011. The Americans forget this far too easily because they want to give credit to the Obama administration. And of course, it's, you know, let the Americans celebrate their climate heroes, for God's sake. Like, the more they do that, the better. But, but effectively, it was the EU at Durban that said, if we commit to another round of Kyoto unilaterally, will you, China and India, actually open conversations about making commitments yourself? But it, at Paris in 2015, they didn't make explicit commitments. They just simply said, we will do better and we will work towards. So to have two dates and to have neutrality by, by sometime before 60 is, is game changing. Uh, you know, and it, you know, it must be rocking whatever contingent of people do climate policy in India quite dramatically, because now the ball is very much in their court. And I'm trying to think through right now, like what the implications for the wider emerging market world. One Belt, One Road will have to be completely transformed because right now it's an engine of fossil capitalism. Um, it's changed the game as the Chinese did it unilaterally. I think we felt we would probably have to like bargain with them in various ways. Certainly the pr all of the premise of American climate policy was that the Americans would have to leverage something out of the Chinese. And if the Chinese had just said, no, we're going to do it. Another way of reading it, it seems to me, is much more, well, not, it's not pessimistic, it's just more realistic, which is to say, well, at this point, we have to give up any fantasy that climate politics was some sort of liberal hobby horse. I mean, if somebody like she is saying this, given the cost this will inflict, again, it'll be good for China overall, but but, but the, the distributional price that's going to be paid within China, as heavily committed to coal as it is, forget Poland, this is way, way, way more deeply entrenched and much more recent and much more painful. This problem must be serious as a heart attack, right? This, I mean, if they're saying this, what he is basically saying is, we, there's one thing we know he's serious about, it's perpetuating the rule of the CCP for another 100 years, yeah. with his regime as being the inaugural phase, because they believe they are facing troubles like we haven't seen in a hundred years i think we should take all of this at face value and if we do what they're saying is we're not in the negotiating game anymore we need to fix this it's quite impressive and and, and it's it's it should be terrifying in a sense <laughs> you know because and they have also however said if you do the math on this i haven't done it precisely but if you look at the rough figures they are also going to claim They've staked, another way of reading this is to say, you know, we can now do their carbon budget all the way through to the end. And it is telling us that they are going to claim his, as much historically as Europe, probably, um, in the sense that their overshoot over what would be reasonable in relation to their population size is going to approach that of advanced economies. So this puts a huge bur bur burden, I think, on um, uh, 
carbon capture, uh, climate, uh, carbon capture technologies, because there's just really no way this is going to work out. If India makes the same claim as China now, like, because um, you know, so the Indians are nowhere near the Ch Chinese current levels. If, if, we, if everyone else says, right, the Chinese path is the path that we're entitled to, we need huge carbon, carbon capture technologies, um, which, we don't, which we don't have at scale yet. So it's, it's a very, it's an absolutely decisive move in the history of humanity if you think the climate problem is serious, but it, it's, I think, quite ambiguous. I didn't, you know, it's too easy to read that statement as just a positive, oh, he saved the world, which is what my editors at the, the foreign policy stuck on the article, which is quite irritating. Uh, they have staked a claim. They have said what they think the problem is and what they're willing to do. And because they're the biggest by far, they change the parameters for everyone else. Totally. Well, I could be talking about climate now for another 15 minutes, but I think we took already too much of your time. That's very, very kind. Uh, we, it was a fascinating conversation. Thanks very, very much, Adam. And, uh, Absolute pleasure. We'll continue, to, uh, continue sometime uh, over a glass of beer when the whole COVID is gone and, yeah. uh, and, and life comes to us, you call it the semblance of normalcy. I look Thanks forward very to it much. very much. Thank you very much for having me on. Thanks. It was a pleasure.